This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. We have got a massive weekend in college football coming up in week number 10. We got Tennessee at Georgia, Alabama, LSU, and some other big games to break down. So we're going to bring on Ben, ben Brown of Pro Football Focus to get his read on that game and so much more of the college football playoff rankings to get you set for week 10 in college football. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Dr. Ed Fang, find his work over at thepowerrank.com. You can catch Ed on Twitter as well, over at the Power Rank. Ed, happy week 10. Happy college football playoff rankings complaining Wednesday to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing better than TCU fans, so I guess I can't complain. Uh, poor Parker, you know, uh, you know, just uh, can't get any respect out there. Um, yeah. And- and I was, I was uh, reading Bill Elliott, uh, Bud Elliott's uh, Bill Elliott NASCAR on the mind. Uh, Bud Elliott's Twitter, and he was talking about how like he's given up on putting stock in the college football playoff committee and what they say early on. I feel like I'm kind of on board with Bud here. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know. I mean, we'll see. We'll see how this all shakes out. But uh, I'm not that upset over it. I mean, I, I mean, I think those those other teams are better than TCU, and we'll see how we'll see how it goes. We certainly will. And I think the one blessing of the CFP rankings last night is we can pitch the Tennessee Georgia game as being one versus one, depending on the rankings, which is pretty fun. Don't get that very often to break down that game. We'll have Ben Brown, a pro football focus here as well. You can find Ben on Twitter at PFF underscore Ben Brown. He has, does both college football and NFL betting work over at PFF. And Ben, great to have you on the show today. How you doing today? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been a little while since you guys had me on, but I definitely appreciate any time I can come on, you know, uh, and chat some college football. I think this is, you know, very much the week that we kind of want to focus on, you know, college football from a betting perspective, because we have, uh, I would say, a lot, some of, if not the best, you know, marquee matchups. And, you know, with the rankings coming out, it obviously, uh, you know, the, the the playoff picture and everything else and all that's going to break down is, you know, very much fresh on people's minds. So uh, I'm excited. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it gives us fodder to discuss. So I guess that's always good for us. Even if it's not the most predictive stuff, uh, their rankings and all that, we can still talk about it. We'll talk about uh, that Tennessee-Georgia game. We're also going to talk some futures markets because Ben doing some pretty cool work for PFF around the uh, football playoffs. And we'll talk about that in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread. Wherever you get your podcasts, you can also check us out on the FanDuel YouTube page. So subscribe there and also search for Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts podcast nba season is underway and it's the perfect time to download fanduel america's number one sports book because right now new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars to do one thousand dollars back in free bets if your first bet doesn't win fanduel is all your favorite bets from the money line to point spread to player props you can even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay plus with live betting You'll get updated odds on games that have already started. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. So download FanDuel today to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Make every moment more this season with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Must be 21 plus and in select states. First online real money wager only. Refund issued is non-withdrawable free bets that expire in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Kansas, 1-800-788-7977 or 1-800-522-4700 or ksgamblinghelp.com. The numbers all run together. Louisiana, 1-877-770-STOP. In New York, 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-979. In Wyoming, 1-800-522-4700 or in West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Let's take a look now. At week number 10, by starting things off by talking about those playoff rankings last night, we finally got our first read from the committee of what they're doing. And obviously, we can be skeptical of what they're saying if they're trying to drive up ratings, et cetera, et cetera. But there could potentially be some takeaways here. So, Ben, before we talk about um, your simulations over at PFF and stuff like that, were there any betting takeaways for you from what we learned last night, quote unquote, learned last night from, from the committee? 
Yeah, and I think you guys, you know, maybe touched on it a little bit already, but I think, you know, TCU kind of be, kind of being where they're priced at, basically, to make the college football playoffs, plus 500 on draft king, or mm-hmm. FanDuel, sorry, 16.7% uh, implied probability. You can sell whatever book you want, just for the record. You can go ahead. Yes, We're not going to care. <laughs> but this is very much, yeah, um, This th- that is the number on FanDuel. But yeah, it is very interesting to see, you know, where the committee ranks them, kind of based on, you know, the, the difficult stretch schedule that they're going to have after this matchup against Texas Tech, right? I think they're, you know, nine and a half point favorites, minus 285 on the money line, and then they have, you know, back-to-back games against Texas and against Baylor. We actually kind of think that, uh, you know, they're a little bit undervalued in the betting market right now at that plus 500 price. We have them closer to, you know, a 20% implied probability to make the playoffs a lot of that is you know based on where we have them power ranked at in comparison to a team like texas and baylor i think that's you know obviously playing some sort of role in it but i also think that you know having them seventh below a team like alabama kind of you know at least initially forecasting the idea that you know very much a one last sec team is going to get ahead of tcu uh is maybe i think you know uh providing a little bit of value on them to be honest with you we have them as you know the eighth best EPA per pass play so far this season. I've also been really good rushing the football. And it's kind of, you know, flipped on its head a little bit from, you know, the TCU teams of the past that were very, you know, very dominant defensively uh, and really couldn't move the ball uh, all that effectively. I think they're good enough offensively, uh, you know, to kind of run through this difficult schedule. So I like them at plus 500. I think, you know, the question is always with some of these futures, but is, 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 are you better off kind of like rolling in that money line if they, you know, kind of need to run the table in order to get the college football playoffs. They get better off betting them, uh, you know, on the money line for these next five games and just, you know, cashing out that way. And I think, you know, based on where you're kind of projecting the spread for Texas and Baylor to be at, uh, that could be an even more profitable angle to approach TCU than it just is on, you know, the college football playoff futures market, I would say. Ben, where do you have TCU in your, your PFF numbers and, and what's going into that? I, I presume the PFF grades are a key component, but are, are there other factors as well? Yep, very much so. So we do we do definitely do the grades, um, you know, quarterback play specifically. We do basically kind of take all of our opponent adjusted uh, facet grades and kind of throw that together to kind of build out this power ranking. And then we use, you know, a few different power ranking uh, approaches within our simulation and also, you know, in our green line models and those sorts of things. So not trying to like, you know, do a bunch of different work, but I think we have what I would consider like, you know, three underlying power metrics and those things kind of go into the, you know, create some sort of like composite score for how we view every team. So we have a TCU, you know, seventh basically right now, uh, kind of using that combined metric. I think they, you know, sit right below uh, a team like Tennessee, who we are, I would say, uh, very much low on, especially in comparison to the betting market. And I think that's, you know, our one real main blind spot with kind of how we have, uh, you know, these top tier teams kind of fleshed out a little bit. But, you know, outside of Tennessee being wrong, I do think that there's, you know, a, a very strong case to be made for any of these other seven teams, you know, potentially, uh, you know, having what it takes, I would say, to at least get into the college football playoff and from there, you know, knock off an SEC team and, uh, you know, win the championship, I would say. So it's 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 interesting. Yeah, we have long-winded way of saying we have TCU uh, seventh, I would say, uh, in our power rankings metric. Yeah, now you alluded to the simulations and the tough part with that is that it does depend on the human element because there are literal humans who, who lean on metrics to make these decisions. But how do you kind of bake that into a model? Because it sounds like a very, that probably would be the toughest part. So I might be asking you a, a very difficult question, but like, how do you account for that when building that model out? Yeah. And we very much, you know, rely on, uh, like situations and decisions that the, the committee's made in the past, right? I think there's very much been, you know, a, a bias towards an SCC team with a one last team still getting in if they don't win their conference championship. So we very much priced it in where, you know, if, if you're not in, if you're not in the SEC, you're essentially not going to get in if you don't win your conference championship, I would say, you know, obviously, you know, the teams like Notre Dame and, and all things considered, they're obviously not going to play in it, but that that is of course folded in as well. And we do have, you know, some level of expectation of a team like Notre Dame and what they have to kind of accomplish to get in. So we basically have, you know, an idea and model for every type of team and every type of conference. And from there, you know, based on the simulation results, as we step through each game, we can kind of price out, you know, who's the most likely or the, or the top end teams that the committee is going to choose in this particular simulation. So it is, you know, it's very much, I would say, not a, 
not a perfect science or whatever. It is, you know, something that, you know, we try to improve upon it. We probably didn't improve upon it, you know, as much as we would have liked to in the off season, but um, it, it, it is a, you know, kind of an interesting and fascinating question because of the, you know, like you said, the, the human element of, you know, these trying to size up two teams that didn't play each other and don't really have any common opponents and, you know, all these other factors that go into it. Uh, and, and very much, I would say, you know, unfortunately probably some biases as well that, uh, you know, we see kind of year in and year out as far as, you know, what teams the and, and what divisions and what conferences, uh, you know, the, the committee maybe over or undervalues a little bit. Awesome. Let's move on to some big games. Obviously, the biggest one is Tennessee at Georgia. Georgia's eight, eight and a half point favorite, total of 65 and a half. Uh, Tennessee's obviously looked very good this year. Uh, so is Georgia. So what is your take on this game? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, from our from PFS perspective, like I said, I think we're sitting lower on Tennessee than what I even, you know, in some ways would be comfortable with right now. Uh, and we still kind of have them only as, you know, a, a six point differential on a neutral field right now. Obviously, you know, the fact that this is in Georgia, everything else flips it to eight and a half. But we are very much kind of on market in this particular matchup. But you know, throwing all of, you know, what I'm looking at, at least as far as like our model specific metrics, I think, I think Tennessee has uh, a pretty clear advantage in this match. But I think, you know, some of our stuff still bakes in uh, an expectation of a Georgia defense. That's probably not as good as what we're actually, or, or probably thinks it's a lot better than what we're actually going to see on the field here. Um, you know, on Saturday, we still have them as the third best run defense in the SEC, second best coverage unit, but uh, 11th best from a pass rush perspective uh, and, and no Nolan Smith, right? And I think the, the pressure situation specifically with Hendon Hooker has kind of been the, the one spot where he's maybe had a little bit of a hang up. And I think that, you know, scheming with Hoople's, uh, you know, offensive scheme and how they're kind of going to approach that, they're going to be able to alleviate a lot of those pressure situations. And that makes me uh, really nervous that Georgia, you know, it, it is going to be able to contain Tennessee's offense enough to actually keep this game, you know, within reason. And I just don't know if, uh, you know, Georgia offensively maybe has uh, enough of a top end range to win a shootout matchup with Tennessee. So I think if you're leaning, you know, in any one direction, it, it very much is setting up as, you know, it, despite the somewhat widespread Georgia to probably cover and this game to go under or it, in a very wild game, you know, kind of, not not in the same ilk as the Tennessee Alabama game, but right. you know a game that very much gets up there in scoring, uh, and Tennessee has the possession and wins that at the end. That's kind of you know the 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 two I would say pretty much straightforward handicaps, and I think it's kind of tough to deviate from uh, you know that expectation based on what I'm looking at right now. Does that wind up being a stay away for you then, based mm -hmm. on the two very clear paths, or would you be looking to potentially a you know a a dual situation thing? Maybe you parlay together a. Tennessee plus eight and a half with the over or Georgia minus eight and a half in the under. I think that like you could go that route, but it seems to me as if the read winds up this being more of a don't bet it and enjoy the game situation more than anything else. Yeah. And, or, or, you know, the other nice thing and something that I've, you know, trying to or probably actually done a lot more this year than I have in years past is kind of, you know, read out the first couple of possessions, you know, watch the first sure. couple of scripted plays specifically. And then, and then kind of see if, you know, if, 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 if Tennessee's, you know, very much getting the ball out, maybe they have a drop or something, or maybe they have a, you know, a negative play from a penalty perspective or something like that, that kind of stalls out one drive. I, I still think that would maybe be a reason to, you know, potentially buy into them a little bit. And if they are moving the ball, you know, somewhat effectively, uh, you know, playing something on the over, even if there are, you know, a couple of early scores would probably be something I'd be pretty comfortable with as well. So I think, you know, understanding, you know, directionally how you kind of see the game playing out and then, you know, waiting for that initial confirmation is also something I think can be, uh, you, you know, pretty profitable and pretty worthwhile strategy to explore. One more thing in this game, you mentioned that you're that PFF is a bit lower on Tennessee than the market, and they actually viewed them as being properly valued in this game. Does that mean you're also a bit lower on Georgia than the market? I mean, I, I see, I don't know, because we have Georgia as the number one team in the country, right? And I think, it, you know, it's pretty clear that they are, uh, you know, pretty sizably, uh, you know, ahead of the rest of the market, right? We have them, you know, kind of like two and a half points better than Ohio State on a neutral field, uh, you know, three points better, essentially three and a half points in some ways better than Alabama. So it's 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 weird in that, um, you know, I would have expected to probably be on Georgia. Maybe it's just, you know, a bias towards us not really 
wanting to play some of these more heavy heavy favorites in a lot of situations, I think is partially why the model is, you know, not finding a ton of value on Georgia specifically in this matchup. All right, let's move on to the next game. We have Alabama at LSU. Alabama's pretty big uh, road favorite, 12 and a half points here, total of 57 and a half. Uh, Bryson looks like he's back from that injury. Um, my numbers have liked LSU this year. What are you saying? What, saying, what are you seeing in this game? Yeah, I, I still, I, I've probably bought into Alabama more than I should this year, but I think this is a spot that they, you know, definitely take care of business. I think, you know, a lot of what has been successful for LSU offensively has come, you know, Jaden Daniels and kind of these, you know, scramble situations, high level of success, you know, in breaking the pocket and kind of making his own plays. And I think that, you know, Alabama specifically has, you know, very much en enough from an athlete's perspective on the edge to kind of try and contain him. Maybe some of those plays, you know, if, if they're not going for big gains, they're only going for short losses because Alabama's kind of able to keep contained with him in the pocket. And I think that, you know, could very much cause uh, the LSU offense to kind of break down in the last situations. And like you said, with with Bryce Young back and in the fold, uh, I I'm expecting a little bit of, you know, a, a show out game, I would say in some ways for Alabama, who, you know, probably wants to put on, you know, a few quality performances, even as a one last team to, you know, maybe look good in the eyes of the committee and everything else. And I think we've seen that kind of play out, you know, in years past. So uh, I, I think it's kind of Alabama or a bust for me in this spot. Uh, but I'd be I'd be open to hearing the LSU case. I just I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time kind of seeing it for this particular matchup. Yeah, my, my numbers like LSU on both offense and defense when I look at adjusted success rate 13th on offense. 19th on defense it is a talented squad um but you know i mean alabama's also really good and they're gonna have the best player on the field as well so it, it's just a matter of whether that number is too big right. whether right. whether ls you can get a backdoor cover or potentially even keep it close keep it within a one score game I do want to talk about Bryce Young really quickly while we're here, uh, because you do some work around the NFL draft. We had you on to talk NFL draft back in April, I believe, um, talking about that with Bryce Young. You know, what's your read on him? Uh, do you think that he we should be viewing him as like a when we're trying to, you know, bet these college football games? Ed's talked about how NFL draft stock of quarterbacks can actually matter in terms of this stuff. <laughs> how do you view Bryce Young in that regard? And what does that do for you for viewing this Alabama team? Yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, it, 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 I do think he is, you know, one of the two best quarterbacks that, you know, that we're going to have in this class at the NFL level for sure. And, and I very much think that, you know, it matters, especially in big time spots, um, you, you know, kind of gravitating towards that guy who you very much think is, you know, pro ready and, and kind of showcasing that. I think it's, you know, very much a reason to buy into. And I think that, you know, Bryce Young kind of finally coming back from the injury a little bit, maybe feels like he has a little bit of ground to make up or whatever. Right. And I do think that, you know, him putting forth a good game, especially after a bye, you know, especially given, you know, some of the things that we've heard, at least as far as like where he ranks from, you know, a quarterback pers prospect perspective, uh, very much can, can can kind of be baked into that equation. So, you know, he's he's been really good. I think he's PFFs, um, I want to say top graded quarterback so far this year in, in his limited sample size. I don't have it quite in front of me, of course, but, um, you know, it has very much, I would say, um, showcase at certain points that he can definitely be, you know, a top end guy at the NFL level. And I think that, you know, that and him kind of finally being at full strength definitely matters for this particular high handicap in this game, I would say. Yeah, Jim, I definitely believe in, in looking at these guys, NFL prospects uh, as part of handicapping college football games. I will say that I've been kind of stunned that at one point, Anthony Richardson would had the fourth highest odds to be the first pick in the NFL draft. Uh, he is no longer the fourth highest. Um, that was a wild week. <laughs> that was a wild week. And like, I, um, so I tweeted that out and someone tweeted back like, uh, have they watched him throw the football? <laughs> and then the sports book tweeted back like, we don't watch the games. He's not a running back. <laughs> oh no, that is a weird week. <laughs> Which I thought was awesome. And then and then also like Will Levis is also pretty high on these markets to be the first pick. And um, you know, I saw a little bit of the game against Tennessee. I, I, I don't see it on the field. Tennessee's a team that the one thing they can't do is defend the pass that well. And yeah, I don't know. Maybe his hand is still banged up. 
Um, I don't really know what's going on there too, but uh, it's interesting how, you know, some of these markets kind of mesh with reality sometimes. Right. No, I, I think it is really interesting. And the Will Levis thing, especially it's like, you know, not a lot of people were talking about him. And then, you know, some of the guys, I would say specifically in the draft community kind of start to say, you know, he's very much, you know, this intriguing type of prospect. And then all of a sudden he vaults up to being, you know, very, very likely to potentially be, you know, at least in the discussion for the number one pick. But, um, you know, his injury right. situation as well, obviously, is very much, yeah. you know, uh, you know, playing a part of that. But he I think he's a guy as well that can is going to you know, look really good in, you know, shorts and a t-shirt and probably is going to make yep. every single throw on the football field from that. Bingo. Uh, and that's in that situation. Right. And I think that, you know, pricing that out and at least trying to evaluate that in, in the context of the actually, actually watch them play college football as well as is, is kind of a really interesting, you know, really interesting endeavor, at least as far as, you know, how, how the off season workouts can greatly impact, you know, the movement of these players and where they're going to end up going in the draft. Ben, I think you hit it right on the head. If Will Levis is Stetson Bennett's height, <laughs> right, 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 the same right. odds to be the first pick in the NFL draft. Yeah, they still owe the tall guys. I don't blame them, but uh, it's definitely still a thing. Let's finish up here with Clemson at Notre Dame. Some movement here in the uh, spread. It was four and a half yesterday. Clemson now a three and a half point favorite at Notre Dame. Total is 44 and a half. And Clemson's played a lot of close games this year, uh, but they are still undefeated. You know, that counts for something, I guess. So what's your read on Clemson entering this game and the betting markets for this game? Yeah, I mean, I just haven't really been, I would say, all that impressed with the Clemson offense. I know it was really easy to hate on, uh, you know, DJ U Galloway early on in the season. But I think it's more, you know, the, the scheme situation and the play call. And I mean, they really mm -hmm. only run, you know, a handful of plays. They run like RPOs, bubble screens and fade or go routes or whatever. Right. And that kind of seems to be their offense. And there's, there's no unique wrinkle in a lot of ways. And I think that, you know, looking at, you know, a team like Tennessee versus a team like Clemson, like, you know, Josh Hoople is very much adding in a lot of these things and maximizing his quarterback's potential. And I don't think we're really seeing that, you know, from Clemson's viewpoint. So I think it's a little bit of, you know, a rebound spot for Notre Dame. Once again, I think they're going to, you know, even get even more back on track after, uh, you know, the performance against Syracuse last week and kind of a, you know, a dominating win, I would say, uh, and, and kind of kind of escape a little bit of their, you know, early season struggles. So I'm leaning in Notre Dame's direction. It seems like the betting market, you know, has kind of moved from like, you know, even four and a half and we were kind of first talking, you know, up to three and a half now. So, um, you know, as we kind of get closer to game time and some of those, you know, limits change for people, and we could see, you know, some further movement. Maybe we even do test three right now. So I, I think Notre Dame is, uh, you know, kind of the play. I just haven't been, you know, all that impressed with Clemson bringing it, you know, every single drive in a lot of situations. They've had a few big plays, but uh, if Notre Dame kind of forced them to, you know, play underneath, uh, I think they're going to get off the field quite a bit uh, on a lot of drives, I would say. Well, the scheme thing is something that was there even when they had Trevor Lawrence. Like, it yep. was like really frustrating to watch them because it's like you have like this, like, perceived like generational like talent and you're just like running screens like right well what do we like th this this scheme has been this way for a while and it's like i don't know it's somehow more frustrating that it's still happening now than it was with lawrence there and it would like drove me nuts at that time right because and, and they and, and and not that they don't have the athletes to run it now or whatever right. but it was very much like you know we're watching this quote unquote generational talent, like you said, and they have Travis Etienne. It's like, well, yeah. you know, as a first round pick or something, you, maybe you want to get your, your ball, the ball in the, your playmaker's hands. Um, but it is, it, it's kind of been the same thing. And, you know, every single year, if they continue to kind of roll it out, I feel like that's, you know, one more reason why defenses should be even further ahead of them. And I think that's why, you know, they're very much, even though they're still winning, I would say they're very much not thought of as like, you know, the elite level Clemson teams, partly because of the talent, but partially because, uh, there's just no creativity, I would say, offensively. Awesome. Uh, any other games that uh, you are liking this week, Ben? Yeah, I think, you know, tonight in match, and I, I was kind of ice cold yesterday riding Buffalo, but I'm going to go back to the well here with, you know, Central Michigan. The line has moved against me a little bit. I think it's up to like five, even five and a half right now. 
Um, I, I kind of like them as a you know, first half play plus three and a half. I think they're kind of interesting. So if matching's kind of your thing Wednesday night, I don't think there's any baseball or too many other, you know, outside of outside of the NBA or something, too many other options. So I like <laughs> Central Michigan tonight. Uh, and, and one that I think is, you know, you know, uh, another rivalry game uh, talking about, but Miami plus seven, seven and a half against Florida State. I do think that, you know, anything can kind of happen in these matchups, right? But I do think Miami, you know, I would say from a, from a, from a quarterback perspective, uh, you know, better quarterback. We have this uh, much closer from a power rankings perspective. We would basically make Florida like, uh, you know, a two and a half point favorite on a neutral field. So the fact that we're getting, you know, plus seven and a half, uh, I, I very much think this game is setting up as a one score game. So I uh, definitely like the Hurricanes plus seven and a half. I think, uh, you know, as well as one of my favorite bets here from week 10. I respect the commitment to Maction over the World Series. Uh, I'll be watching the World Series, but I, I respect <laughs> I the commitment. The <laughs> I, for, I did it. I feel like they just played baseball yesterday, though. So I had to assume that it was, but I guess there was a rain out or something. Right. That's right. Yeah. No, well. we're, we're getting it every day for the next couple of days. <laughs> You've got your band, your brand, Ben. You got to stick to it. I respect right, it. There's right. no other way to go than that. Ed, what about you? What are you seeing for week 10 based on your numbers? Yeah, I mean, I think the most interesting game that I see um, is uh, is this uh, Texas A&M and, and Florida game. So my numbers have the total at around 50. Um, ben and I are obviously giving out the best bets in the history of podcasting this week because this also moved against me today. It went up from about 54 and a half to 55 and a half. Um, I have been on Texas A&M. I'm, unders a lot this year their defense has actually played up to the level of recruiting that jimbo fisher has had the offense absolutely has not mm -hmm. uh it's been pretty bad a lot of that has to do with the quarterback position haynes king came in got benched backup got hurt uh haynes king actually dislocated his shoulder against south carolina and they had to pop it back in and then connor wegman came in he, he was a true freshman kind of struggled to finish out that game but then, you know, had a pretty good game last week against Old Miss. And I think this total is high, kind of based on that performance. I, I just I just don't, you know, on the other side of the ball, well, let's talk about Anthony Richardson, right? Like a guy that I trust to, to get yards with his legs, but not really to throw the football. He's going to be going up against a really good Texas A&M defense. Texas A&M on offense, you know, I mean – Florida is not the best defense. They haven't been uh, this year under Bill and Napier. So I feel like the market has moved a little bit because of one performance from a freshman quarterback. Um, I've gotten burned a bunch fading freshman quarterbacks. I think it's a different era than, than what it used to be. Uh, I think these kids play so much more football. So, so maybe this kid is going to be great. I'm not buying it. I like the under in this game, uh, Texas A&M and Florida. Fun feeling to have everything moving against you. I've had that at times too, so I, I get it for both you guys. But we'll so see. Really, at least we're out. open in admitting it, you know. Yeah, right. uh, some of these other shows are like, oh yeah. I mean, didn't help me to get movement on the Bucks money line last week, so maybe right. maybe CLV is overrated, and I'm just I'm it just a dog. Did not help here. me to get massive closing line value on the Rams last week either. So did not help Jamar Chase stay healthy, got the, the movement on the Bengals and it all went away once Jamar Chase is out. So who cares at this point? That's the way things go. That is Ben Brown checking out on Twitter at PFF underscore Ben Brown. Ben, of course, doing NFL and college football work over there. Ben, we appreciate the time. Good luck to you with the action and good luck to you overall in week 10 as well. Thank you guys. Yeah. Good, good luck to you as well. Uh, and have a great rest of the show. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Uh, and what is going on for you over at the Power Rank? Oh, yeah. I'm writing my free sports betting email newsletter. Uh, talk about bets that I make and also 7 Nuggets Saturday, which is a curated list of sports betting tips and news. So check that out at thepowerrank.com. And what's going on for you on the Football Analytics Show? Uh, the episode isn't out this week, but uh, it'll be... It'll be a good enough episode that I will plug it next week when when I'm on. <laughs> okay. So that's what they call a tease, folks. So a uh, good, good episode coming up on the Football Analytics Show. Check out that podcast feed and eagerly await when that one does drop. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck to you if you decide to tail Ben on that match. And we'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down week number nine in the NFL. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast. Network.